are listening to I Am Refocused Radio with your host, Shamaya Reed. This show is designed to inspire you to live your purpose and regain your focus. And now, here's your host, Shamaya Reed. Hey, welcome to I Am Refocused Radio. We are here once again. And today, we have another show lined up for y'all today. We have our special guest that has an amazing book that we're going to be talking about. Our special guest today is Ms. Farah. And her book is entitled The Hair and Me. It's going to be an awesome show today. We're going to learn about her, her background, and everything that she does. So first and foremost, Ms. Farah, how are you doing? Hi, Shamir. Thank you for having me on your show. I'm doing good um, speaking to you all the way from Dubai. Awesome. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm, I know we have different uh, time right now, but I appreciate you yeah. uh, being open to, you know, squeeze this interview in. So... First and foremost, before we dive into the book, let's talk a little bit about your, your uh, background. Very, very diverse. So kind of tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure, thank you. Um, so as people can hear me, the accent's a little bit different. I'm sure most of you are listening to um, America. So I live in Dubai today, um, and it's been my home for the last 22 years. Originally, I was born in London. Um, and then when I was four years old, my mother took me to see my maternal grandmother in India. My mother came from India. And uh, we ended up through a series of circumstances staying there for the next 14 years. So I grew up in India um, in a Muslim city, predominantly it used to be ruled by the Nawabs. And in India, the mythology is mainly Hindu around. And the convent where I was educated was run by um, Catholic nuns who the missionaries had come and settled in India and opened these schools. And if you wanted an English medium education in India, you went to the missionary run schools, which is where I was educated. And by faith, I'm a Parsi, I'm Zoroastrian, um, which is a religion that came out of ancient Persia and the group of Zoroastrians who went from a port called Pars to India to seek asylum, are called Parsi. So it's a community within the Zoroastrian. So I'm a Parsi by faith. So um, I know that was a bit of a mouthful, but in Dubai, typically, because everyone's from all over the world, the first question anyone asks is, where are you from? And I always have to stop and think, do I give them the long answer or the short answer? Um, so I gave you all the long answer, and hopefully um, that sort of explains a bit of the background that um, has shaped who I am today. Oh, that's fine because, like I said, you, you have a very diverse uh, background. I mean, you're like a citizen of the world. So when you look at uh, how life was growing up, what was some of the, uh, how close were you and your mom and what was it like uh, growing up with her? So I think growing up, we went through maybe a little bit of a roller coaster and the relationship changed. Um, Mom was a young mother. um, And when we went back to India, there was difficulties with my father and she was separating and leaving him. So I think that was a little bit perhaps of a tense time for her. She was finding her footing back in India again. and She went back to study law and train as a lawyer. She had done a couple of years before she got married and she went up to finish up and practice law. Um, So when we were younger, um, you know, my grandmother, my mother's mom, my maternal grandmother was more present in terms of the, the, if you like, the foundation and the person at home. But as we grew older, my mother, who was this huge personality, um, once I had gotten past the teens, I think, which were, again, a little bit fraught, um, we became friends. And when I had my own children, you realize, you know, the depth of a mother's love. And it's not always packaged the way you kind of think it might be, but it's always there and it's always present. And it really cemented it for me. And our relationship was really strong um, as I grew older, I'd say. And with your uh, professional background, we know about your uh, early years. But when you started to uh, work in the bank uh, mm-hmm. uh, industry and also you were working as a trainee in, in London at age 18, 
guy and tell us a little bit about uh, your professional life. Sure. So I actually wanted to be a doctor. So I studied the sciences. Um, in India, your choices of subjects were dependent on the careers you chose, and the career choices were limited. I means we're talking 50 odd years ago, right? So it was if you wanted to be a doctor, you chose biology and chemistry and physics. And if you wanted to be an engineer, you swapped the biology with maths. And, you know, if you did anything other than those sort of known respected professions, then you took the arts. So because I wanted to be a doctor, I studied biology, physics and chemistry. And then, unfortunately, um, when I went back to London aged 18, I couldn't study medicine because financially I wasn't eligible for any concessions or, you know, loans or anything like that. that my parents were not living in London. And so I started um, looking for work and, you know, just to sort of subsidize my way through there. And through a series of, through the network, I was um, introduced at a bank and interviewed by these individuals as a for a trainee position, a starter position, you know, literally filing, making coffee, um, that kind of stuff. Um, and I got a job in a bank, age 18, and I built my career from there. And I'm still in banking 30 odd years later. Um, and it's really just hard work, um, applied myself, persevered, um, was diligent. And I think part of the drive for me was failure was not an option. I didn't have a fallback position. My parents, you know, my father was absent. Um, my mother couldn't afford necessarily to fund my way through university. And because I wasn't eligible for grants or scholarships or any of that, um, I just worked really hard and made sure I could support myself. Once again, listen on Refocus Radio, talking to our guest, Farah. And when you look at the opportunity that you had to start writing the book, also a fun fact that I read in your bio is that you are an avid baker and you dream of owning a cafe in the future. And also you yeah. uh, are passionate about yoga. I am, yeah. It is so yoga has and baking sort of became my tools. And you know, when I lost my mother, there were things, there were like little pegs in the day that kept me grounded and, you know, centered and just able to get through the the day, each day at a time. Um, yoga for me was moving meditation. It was the space where I could just allow a pause between the thoughts or the sort of waves of grief that used to come through. And baking was, the love of food has come through the family. My grandmother used to love baking and cooking, and my mother also loved cooking, but not so much the baking necessarily. And I've got a bit of a sweet tooth, but I always thought it was a bit indulgent to bake a whole cake just to have a piece for me. But when my daughter was born, I was in London, and um, it was cold outside. It was November, and we were at home, and you know, when she used to sleep, I'd be making meals or trying new things. And there were these recipes that came through for biscuits in the Sunday newspaper and the magazine. And I tried them. And what really appealed to me was you could make the dough and freeze or, you know, put the batch of dough in the fridge and just use the amount you needed. So I tried and I made a couple of biscuits and they came out really nice. And people who tried them, my friends and family, they loved them. So that sort of inspired me to keep trying different recipes and baking. And then when mum passed, it was a way of, again, disengaging the mind. I'd go into the kitchen and, you know, look for what to bake, take out the ingredients and just make something that would smell nice and taste nice and bring a bit of joy to the people that tried it. And that used to lift my spirits um, a little bit. So yoga and baking became two of my tools. And then the book sort of organically just happened. It was um, literally sitting at home, words started coming out and was around the main sort of the event. And then, you know, slowly with time, I did a bit of research, spoke to family members and built the story, you know, starting from the background of mom through to um, the current day. And 
cover the incident of the loss of my mother um, and then how I dealt with it and how I've overcome it and found, you know, that you have to go internal and go inside of yourself to discover your own strength. Um, but the book is A Labor of Love and it's paying homage to my mother um, and the legacy that she'd left behind. And like you said moments ago, you, you kind of tied them both together, uh, the inspiration behind the book. And and people can go to your website, uh, firepress.com, and they can read more information about your book. And for those who are listening, the book is entitled uh, Meher and Me. And they can go to firepress.com slash uh, Meher dash me to even read more about your book and some of the details uh, behind the scenes. Now, the theme of the book, uh, the focus of the book, it emphasizes on the idea of of uh, personal uh, growth and transformation. Can you share how uh, the experiences of uh, difficult times and overcoming them, how how that led to growth and for you and your mom? Sure. Um, I think sort of if I look at the trajectory of my life, right, um, here I am aged a certain age. Um, and I look back and I think the lesson started fairly early on. If you can imagine age four being taken from London to a small town in India. And if you go for a holiday, you're cocooned in, you know, the home or the circle that you're mixing in. But then you're told or you're not not even told it just so happens that you're living there so the sense of displacement and the sense of belonging and finding that within oneself is again you know a lifetime's journey um for today for me when you say i'm a citizen of the world for me to feel comfortable wherever you place me didn't come easily it was a hard one um achievement if you like or a hard one skill which Again, I learned through repetition of being in India, but not being from India, you know, not really belonging in the society that I was brought up in and finding my own way and my own voice there. And then when I went to London, like age 18, again, it was a crossroads driven by passports and where one could stay and where one could study. And again, it was a case of having to find a way to identify what route I could take whilst back in London because the normal route of going to university wasn't available to me. So um, again, I, I needed to find a way to do it. Um, and again, that was a learning and a lesson in there. And then through life, it's just been the corporate culture. I didn't have a blueprint for it, but it was something that I learned and I mastered. And again, it's through repetition. Um, if I look at grief or loss, I don't think they're taught how to deal with grief, right? It's no one really knows the skill and everyone will have a different experience. But again, learning to be self-reliant in a way because I didn't have the parent that anchored me or the parent who was my foundation and my father had been absent throughout my life so it was a question of when I lost my mother you know I had no one to turn to you know if something good happened I'd call mom if something not good happened I'd call mom um, and I didn't have that anymore so it was again finding your strength within you and learning um, it's almost self-mastery right you just need to be able to stand still and find the answers within yourself so I think one of the repeated themes I feel through my life has been um, learning to be independent or learning to be self-reliant or finding everything I've needed within myself rather than looking to anyone else for it would be some of the lessons I'd say have come and have made me the person I am today, which is, you know, sort of independent. I'm able to stand on my own. I am hopefully you know, open and sort of aligned in integrity, my thoughts and my words and my actions. And I've found a way to be within this sort of very global world we live in. 
the Sound Refocus Radio talking to our guest today, Farah, and her book, uh, Meher and Me, A Mother-Daughter Relationship Memoir about the life we choose for the lessons we will learn. Now, come to your mom. I mean, what's some of the best memories that you had with your mom? Mom was always the life and soul of every party. So my fondest memories are, you know, the house filled with people, there's music, people are dancing, there's tons of food, and it goes on, you know, almost all night through till the early morning. Um, and some of the times, mom, when I used to go to school and mom worked as a lawyer, she wouldn't always be up when I left for school early. But the only time I ever saw her at the breakfast table was when she had partied all night during the Diwali festival in India where people play cards to, again, pay um, homage to the goddess of wealth, Lakshmi. And she would play cards and come home and she'd be coming home to go to bed as I was leaving to go to school. And we'd meet and, you know, share um, stories and laugh about her night or, you know, I would tease her about how untraditional a mother she was. Um, and just, she always used to tease me and tell me to lighten up and she would make me laugh at myself, um, which I, I miss terribly. Um, and food, you know, I remember sitting at the dinner table and mom would have these sort of flatbreads, Indian flatbreads come out and mush them up with butter and sugar and, you know, as a little sweet ending to your meal. But it would just be always bountiful. The table was always bountiful. Um, and there was abundance. Um, so it's kind of that living life large, that abundant outlook, um, the joy in sort of most situations. And she could talk to anyone and she would get along with almost anyone um, and find a way to connect with them. And um, there's so many people that claim my mother was their best friend. It's uh, it's quite, quite... Um, astonishing, I think, and quite admirable that she was able to connect with so many different people from different walks of life. And when you kind of touched earlier about, you know, navigating through life, you know, it's a process, you know, so using different tools to handle life's challenges. You mentioned your mom was a lawyer. Did she uh, have deep discussions with you about how to look at life's challenges? I think mom, I think mother's, <laughs> I'm to say, the, her style of parenting was probably not so much, you know, to direct or even to necessarily talk about life's challenges. It was more a question of living them and showing us through her actions. Um, when she was a lawyer, she would take on cases for the underprivileged or the underdog and, you know, fight what would almost be deemed the lost cause, especially women or, you know, women who were um, in trouble. She would definitely take on those cases and support them. One of the things she always used to say, if I ever was in a tricky situation or facing a challenge, was just remember you chose this. And we used to debate that the philosophy of that thought and I would be like how did I choose you know whatever the issue of the time was and she was like we choose the life so mom believed in life and rebirth and she was very spiritual and she would say we choose the lives we come into for the lessons we're meant to learn so what she's referencing is the concept of soul families or um soul sort of networks where you each of the souls chooses or selects the role they will play in this lifetime for themselves and vis-a-vis the people within the family and the lessons each will learn from each other right so um part of what she wanted me to understand was that any of the challenges I was encountering was there to teach me a lesson and in my own way at some level you know way before my recollection starts, I would have chosen to lose, choose, I would have chosen this life to learn these lessons for the evolution of my soul or to help me become the person I'm meant to become in this life and to be able to master those lessons. 
And speaking of uh, mastering those lessons, looking back, I mean, the book is out. It's a best. <clears throat> excuse me, it's a bestseller. You have uh, people giving you feedback on the book. What? What makes you look back and say, "Man, I'm actually I'm doing this," you know? Because you're speaking of learning these uh, lessons through the different challenges, you know, that that come up that are meant to, you know, teach you. So what do you see looking back and like, okay, I'm doing it. I'm, I'm making it, I'm making it work. I think the books also, right? I mean, it's, I know everyone will see the finished product, but it's been a work in progress for a while. And it was this dream or it was, you know, these pages of written word and it was, okay, I'd really like to tell the story. and then. You sort of make it, you know, there's all these conditions on the size and the length and the format and all of that. And you do all of that and you think, okay, now I want to publish it. And then you go through the process with the publishers and, you know, I've lost count of the number of rejections that came. And then through circumstance, and I think timing in life is everything. And, you know, maybe the time was now and people came into my life that helped me on this journey to be able to publish the book. And I think it's about I'm ready to share the story. I think I read somewhere and it says, you tell the story differently when you're healed. I don't know if I might have been able to tell the story the same way a few years ago. Um, I think it's now more accepted and I'm more sort of aware of the situation that's happened and I'm hoping that by sharing the story, I can help people or pass on. And everyone goes through a challenge, right? It's not just me or you. Or, and it's not just loss. It could be financial. It could be relationship. It could be health. So whatever the challenge, all of us are going to face challenges. And it's a question of what tools we find to help us. But I think to your point of I'm doing it, I don't know if I ever sit back and go, you know, <laughs> yes, to everyone, I'm doing it. It's kind of, you know, it's just one day at a time. Okay, what do I need to do to try and tell the story or to publish the book or to, you know, expand the reach and hope people will like what they read and it will touch them and resonate and hopefully help them. Um, I'm not quite sure if I've ever actually paused till you've asked me the question and said, I'm actually doing it. Um, but the reality is I am. Um, and I'm really just hoping the book resonates with people and it achieves what I wanted to achieve, which is just to tell people a story about my mother. It was always just meant to be a mother and daughter story um, at the heart of it. Yeah, that makes sense. And that's that's very interesting uh, perspective because, you know, like cultures are always different. And not everyone stops to say, you know, I'm I'm doing it. So I, I really appreciate your answer. Now, when you look at all the different cultures that you've been able to experience, because like I said in the beginning of the show, you've been able to move around a lot. What stuck out to you? And... Well, some of the common ground, if you will, based on your personal experience. So I think, like if I was to describe myself today, my values are very Indian. Right? My growing, my upbringing in India has given me my value system, I would say. So whether that is duty or responsibility or respecting your elders or, you know, family is sacred those sort of values, a consideration, a hospitality, those come to me from growing up in India. So for me, that is huge. And I feel while I was a child, maybe I didn't appreciate growing up in India because in my head I was uprooted from London and taken to India. So I'm not quite sure I fully appreciated the gift that that upbringing had for me. But it's only with the passage of time that I look and I think, okay, 
if I hadn't grown up in India, I wonder if I would have had the same value system or if I would have held the things that I hold important this in the same manner. So I think that for me stands out the most for myself. And then commonality, I think people and just relationships and relating, like mother-daughter stories are universal, right? They're going to be regardless of cultural geography or um, social economic brackets. That is a universal theme. Um, grief, that is universal. You know, losses, again, cuts across all of us. Um, life changes cut across all of us. Anything you know, absent parents or absent fathers or learning self-reliant. These are all common themes. I think what may differ is the value that different cultures put on certain aspects and the the tools that are available to you to navigate or the societal pressures or the societal perception of how you're meant to navigate or how you're meant to be. But I think these themes of just people relationships, struggle. I think that's such a universal theme. Um, it just, it's global in nature, I would say. Once again, listen, I'll refocus radio. I'm talking to our guest today, Farah, and you can get her book is on Amazon bestseller is uh, Met Hair and Me, a mother and daughter relationship memoir about the life we choose for the lessons we will learn. You can go to her website as well. Uh, it's farahpress.com and go Look more information on her book on her website is farpress.com slash meher dash me. Once again, I want to say thank you for your time, Far. Thank you so much for hosting me on the show. Um, it's been a great conversation. Thank you.